Star Trek 57, M23, take two. It's the It's Got Star Trek podcast. Call yourself timekeepers. Yet you would turn your back when the future of all sentient life is threatened. Even if a crystal is revealed to you, even if it provides you with the answers you seek, you are not strong enough to accept them. I'm only asking for a chance to prove it. They enter with conviction, always. They leave broken. Always. I'm not leaving here without that crystal. <laughs> Time will tell. Okay. Um, I propose we just go ahead and start. We start the podcast. Star Trek. Yeah, well, not just Star Trek. It's the It's Got Star Trek podcast. I know what it is. Oh, wow. Yeah, It's Got Star Trek. Oh, I see. Episode 250. Whoa, you got it right. Well, you got it right. It wasn't that uh, difficult to remember that one. That's a that's a good round number. Yeah, but the last three weeks, I kept uh, saying 100 and whatever. Is yeah. That a, 149. Is that a sesquicentennial? Oh, yeah. And you kept falling apart. <laughs> that, that is a fair uh, that approximation of what I was doing. So what, um, what are we doing here? Okay. No, no, all right. We're, we're off to a glorious start here. Mm-hmm. Uh, who has an Olympic fever? Anybody have an Olympic oh, yeah, fever? Nobody? Right. Uh, I forgot. All right. Probably, or, probably not many people. Is that today? Uh, yeah, they started today. The opening uh, ceremonies opening were ceremonies. When, when we're recording. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, uh, Olympics. That uh, places us. Even though these are evergreen episodes, that will temporally align. Yeah, we won't. To, we won't tell you it'll, which. It'll, it'll give people time. context. Pre- precisely. <laughs> context is for kings. That's what I'm as saying. As they say. Um, all right. We don't have Olympic fever, but we do have Jesse fever. Hey. Because we've always oh. got well, this one Jesse hanging around. And we're like, hey. Hey. You want to be even better than one Jesse? What? What if we got a? What Let's we, get two. What if we got another Jesse to join? To Double join down us? on the espresso, kid. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so we are joined this evening by Jesse from the Open Pike Night Podcast. Welcome, Jesse. Thank you. I don't think this will be confusing mm. at all for anyone. <laughs> no. Mm. Yeah. Have we thought of like how we're going to refer to one another? Is it going to be like? J J one and J alpha or something like no, that. No, I mean I thought uh, I thought about that. Uh, yeah, and I, I thought about that, and then I thought, you know, it's funnier if we don't. Yeah, yeah. Uh, It'll yeah. Just be kind of like a, a what was sort of the comical, uh, you know, confusion. Hey, bamboo boy. <laughs> Mr. It'll be yeah, a, an audio free for all. <laughs> what is that? Yeah. It what will. Was be. that supposed to mean? Anyway, um, our, but so Jesse, Jesse, uh, most people are of course going to be aware of the Open Pike Night podcast and who you are. But for those like two or three strange people who don't, Um, uh, would you like to provide a brief description? Synopsis. An an ad, an advert, uh, some sort of compelling uh, summary that would uh, uh, entice people who don't know about the Open Pike Night podcast, because everyone who knows about it listens to it regularly. But the people who don't know about it, they might want to come and and get get uh, get get in on the action. So, what what would you say about the Open Pike Night podcast to get people to listen? Wow, I really wish that I had prepared something, but I guess uh, let's see. Off the top of my head, Open Pike Night is the Strange New Worlds podcast where your personal logs mm-hmm. are the prime directive. We are a call in show. We mostly cover Strange New Worlds, as I just mentioned, and we interview the creators and the cast and everybody behind the scenes of the show and we have people call in like an old timey radio show Mm -hmm. so that they can get their questions about the show specific episodes acting process acting processes all those sorts of things answered directly from the source uh started as just kind of a hey you green shirt guys i'd (laughs) love to do a podcast with you and Cameron suggested, what if we did a Star Trek show that hadn't been off the air for 30 years? <laughs> uh, so 
we went after Strange New Worlds and we figured, all right, we'll do 10 episodes and then we'll call it good. It'll be a lot of fun. But then we started getting interviews yeah. and I remember we that. had not anticipated that at all. So yeah. we we're like, well, let's pretty, just keep going. You guys. Serious and, interviews. Really, yeah. yeah. I think yeah. now we're like 75 episodes in and it's like, oh. uh, it's so much fun. That's hey. most of the reason that we do it is because of how much fun it is. And you guys have, uh, have you, you've been doing uh, on Patreon, just doing some discovery and a few other things here and there, right? On, on, so you guys yeah, we did stuff too. Uh, lower decks and discovery primarily because we sort we felt semi obligated because we received screeners for those which oh, cool. yeah. we did not ask for we were like yeah. oh there must just be a list for star trek people so we got those and we're like let's do something with them uh so yeah those are on our patreon which you can join for as little as two dollars a month ah oh well, they beat us i think we we oh, we have we only have one tier three dollars yeah. a month on our tier currently three dollars if you're listening to the future and the price has gone up tough luck yeah that's just this is inflation. <laughs> get over it that's that's the but way we the need to become goes. more competitive with our pricing i think what you drive the price down <laughs> yeah right. we'll, we'll have a one dollar tier <laughs> yeah we were thinking of uh uh we have a we, we don't know what it is going to be yet but we came up with a title for it one of our for a patreon feature which would be what was it called dan special treats <laughs> is that what it uh, was yeah, yeah we came yeah. up with the title we don't know what it it's about a bit ago, yeah. it's going to be called okay. dan special treats episode one <laughs> we have to come up with the actual what those treats are or let dan do it um, so I i'm already it. interested in that but i <laughs> you guys I, I can't come to a podcast that i love like it's got star trek i literally listen to you guys every week frequently more than once per episode and thank you I, if dan is gonna do a segment that's just him mm -hmm. you should probably call it only dan's right oh yeah <laughs> only oh. dan's you know like only fans oh hey uh, yeah. i'm slow it took me a minute only dan's is that yeah. a reference to i mean oh, he, that's a good, <laughs> i'm slow he's already completely uh, nude <laughs> he just yeah. spends most of the time completely nude <laughs> I did notice that. I didn't know before I got here that you guys recorded in the nude, but yeah. I'm, it's fine. Yeah. It's, it's okay. It's like what was that song, uh, "Eternal Flame" by the by the Was that the Bangles or who? No, who sang that? What are you talking about? My oh. eternal flame. Somebody like that. Yeah, yeah. I know the song, song, but apparently she recorded it in the nude. Oh, okay. I was wondering why. You... I'm gonna like look. <laughs> yeah, that you up. look that one up. I'm gonna look that up because I can't believe it. All right, you look that up. I'll let folks know that. Um, and it, it, they should go check out Open yeah, the, Bike Night. It's fantastic. Eternal Flame. It, 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 Eternal Flame, flang, <laughs> flange. flange. Wow. It's uh, it's Eternal Flame by the Bangles, the Bangles. on on their first third studio album. Their every, first third studio album. Everything in 1988. All right, thank you. That was it. I enjoy that bit of trivia. Mm -hmm. Um, another bit of trivia is that folks who want to check out our Patreon, you can't tell that she's naked. They can go to Patreon.com/slash It's Got Star Trek. Super As I said, you have my support. Super easy. All right. Uh, well, thanks again, Jesse, for joining us this week. And um, we asked, well, okay. I, <laughs> that, see, I was that, right. That took me it's a more second. fun this way. Because, see, you know, Jesse, when I, oh, when yeah, I thank Jesse. Jesse for being here, Je yeah. our, our Jesse said so thank you. Mm -hmm. Or you're welcome, which is even funnier. Okay. See? It's gonna um, be a barrel laugh. Watch it. Watch it. <laughs> it's working out well so far. Um, this is right. an enemy we will only defeat uh, by striking uh, first. We did, we did the uh, Patreon. We uh, welcome Jesse. Uh, so we're all good there. Any news and ups? Does anybody have any news and ups? I don't have any news and news and ups. Uh, tree branch fell in my car. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, everyone's, that sucks. Everyone's dude. okay, though. I just got a foot long dent in the, above my wheel well. Right. Yeah. yeah. But it's the aggravating kind of dent where it doesn't actually damage the, it doesn't stop the car from functioning. It's not like yeah. you were sitting in the car and the tree branch, branch came down out of, out of the sky. No, I walked out my front yard, but yeah, like Patrick said, it's not like it doesn't actually do any cause the, any driving issues yeah. and it's not big enough to be horrific. Was there like a bolt it's, of lightning that was like, and like, I don't know. I didn't hear it. It just it was probably out. just the wind. Yeah. It wasn't that windy. I think it was just maybe just the dead. tree is dying or something, which is unfortunate. Point being dead is tree. that you got to do something about that. Is that it? The dent is not big enough to be horrific, but it's, it's also but it's also like like you know it's there. Mm -hmm. It's big enough to be yeah. seen. So I feel like I should do something, but yeah. I don't fully care. But it's like that in between fence walking sort of like, do I want to do it? Do I want to know? Yeah. I don't know. It's sort of like living in limbo. Because somebody's gonna, you know, somebody's gonna be like, hey, you got a dent in your. Yeah, I know. Limbo. And some guy's gonna be like, I can fix that for you for a hundred bucks. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, you're gonna get that every single day. I know. Until you fix it. I remember that. It's gonna I, be some like old dude. He's like, you got a dent in your wheel wheel. Yeah. 
I, ha- I that happened to me. You're in, losing a, your hope, girl. An older car I had had a dent in it, and I would get that like every day. And like the spiel was always the same. So eventually, I was just like, "No, thank you." And some guy was like, "You don't gotta be rude and interrupt me." I was like. I wasn't trying to be rude. I said, no, thank you. I just am trying to do stuff, and yeah. I don't want to sit here for a minute to like argue with you about why I don't want this service. Anyway, well, all right, I sorry. think everyone has a right to make money in, the, in what, whatever way works with them. Perhaps. But don't get mad at me when I don't want to accept your services. All right. So that uh, that sort of anecdote is uh, helps endear us to the yeah, audience. I know, right? I was just like <laughs> complaining about like <laughs> things that don't matter. It's like, like, we are just like you. <laughs> we also have God send uh, messages in the night mm-hmm. that he's displeased with us by um, by mildly inconveniencing us. Yeah, I know. In the end, it's not a real... They're not real. These are yeah. not real problems, I know. Well, I mean, it's a real problem. There's nothing wrong with complaining about that. No. Okay. Um, so, we haven't even mentioned what we're going to be talking about this week because uh, we asked Jesse, guest Jesse, what he would like to discuss this week. Mm-hmm. And he suggested Star Trek Discoveries Through the Valley of Shadows, right? Shadows? Shadows. Through the yes. Valley of Shadows. Yes, that is it. Yes. That's what I have written down here, but then I suddenly stopped trusting myself. Season for some two, uh, towards the end of season yeah, two. Yeah, season two, episode 12. Don't screw it up. And uh, we'll get right into that. Right before a two part. We'll get into that. Ultimate episode. Shortly. We'll get into that soon. But Would first, this be the penultimate episode? <laughs> no. I. Because the. Because the the next episode is a two parter finale, yeah. but it's anti penultimate. Yeah, anti penultimate. It's an, yeah, because I mean, it, it's two parts. I mean, they have different names. You, you count the two, the two parts. Yeah, because they say part one and part two. But that's the whole argument is whether to make two parters one episode or not. But it depends yeah. how they name it because sometimes yeah. they say part one, part two. Sometimes they use the isn't it part one? one I think it is part and then one, a part two. two and then sometimes they give it a different name. That's what I'm saying. It's one part one, part two. It is part one, part two, but I don't, but I don't, I don't know because since they don't air on TV anymore, it used to be you went by how they right. aired it on TV, like Encounter at Farpoint, yeah. where Emissary was aired as a that's as a true whole business. Anyway, I was just two super, truths super are possible. Yes. The streaming era has robbed us of a data point. Mm-hmm. Data point. It's robbed us of a lot, if we're being honest. <laughs> it, yeah. it really has. Because yeah, I just watched a bunch <laughs> of those. I just watched that season, like all you know. In a binge, I think. Yeah. So. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Well, we'll get to that soon. But first, we have a. We don't have any news em ups, but we do have a. Oh wait, Dan had a news em up, but we're done with that. No, it was a relate em up. That was a relate em up. A wine em up. Wine em up. Jesus. No, I, wasn't, I prefer uh, to call it a wine arena. I mean, you know, I wasn't. You, know. you were a little bit. Um, <laughs> What I'm trying to say is that we have, (laughs) so yeah, that's right, suburban. No, we have a voicemail from Isaac. Uh Aha, from the other side of this crazy ass planet. Mm -hmm. He's down there in Tasmania, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, fighting the good fight. Yes, down in Tasmania, uh, keeping up the defenses down there Mm -hmm. in Tasmania. And this week, for technical reasons, Dan will be playing the voicemail. the The role of voicemail playing will be played by me. Take him up. Hey guys, it's Isaac from Tasmania here congratulating you on 250 episodes of the It's Got Star Trek podcast. I hope that you have another 250 in you, 250,000 more like it. Oh no. (laughs) I listened to your um, Patreon channel and you did an episode on library jokes, but you didn't tell the best library jokes, so I've got that one for you now, guys. I have told this on the Open Mm -hmm. Pike Night podcast. Oh, crap. No. You stopped it, you I son of a it. bitch. Oh, because I forgot that the sound was playing and that if I do shit while the sound's playing, it stops it. <laughs> That's <laughs> actually the punchline to the library joke. Okay. So. Sabotage. It worked really well. This is the first time oh, Dan has oh, Dan has, has had to uh, play oh, the voicemails. Normally, I play the voicemails. Oh. But for reasons that you don't what was, need to know, there was about. something in the Should... background like a dinosaur. Yeah, I was going to say, did you hear did you, <laughs> did you hear the fucking pterodactyls <laughs> by <behind> Isaac? <laughs> You just play from the beginning, Dan, because I want to hear the pterodactyls again. Okay, my bad. I won't do... I mean, my mistake. I, yeah, I won't do no that worries. Again. It's muscle memory. We understand. Yeah. Hey, guys. It's Isaac from Tasmania here congratulating you wow. on 250 episodes of the It's Got Star Trek podcast. <laughs> I hope that you have another 250 in you. 250,000 more like it. Isaac! I like that. I I listened to your um, Patreon channel and you did an episode on library jokes, but you didn't tell the best library jokes. So I've got that one for you now, guys. I have told this on the Open Pike Night podcast, so I'm a little bit embarrassed that Jesse has to sit through it again. And by Jesse, I mean Jesse and not (laughs) Jesse. I hope that makes sense. Clearly. Anyway, (laughs) guy walks into a library and says to the librarian, Can I have some fish and chips, please? And the librarian says, no, mate, this is a library. And the guy replies, oh, I am sorry. 
can I have some fish and chips, please? <laughs> that is a great quality humour. That is perfect. Now, um, Jesse, just to let you know, Jesse, Patrick and Dan are certified dinguses. Oh, yeah. You are now a dingus too, but that's better than being a wiener. So congratulations on that. That is something that um, is club. just official. Now, I've got a poem for you guys. A poem? Roses are Somebody's red. screaming back there now. <laughs> Don't lose it now, Isaac. You've only got 14 seconds left. Um, roses are red. Poems are for crying. I hope that Dan now presses the button labelled Chief O'Brien. Chief O'Brien? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> nice. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> With the end of that. Was that this episode? Yeah, I, I, there was actually two laughs. I cut out, cut out a middle part of someone talking and uh, then stuck the two ends together. Right. Thank you, Isaac. That was yeah, a for real. great voicemail. Thank you, Saru. Uh, the joke was good. Yeah, I'm going to tell that one. I remember hearing that. I, I, I recall, I think, hearing that on uh, Open Bike Night a while back. I'm a little upset that he's just, Recycling you know, jokes. Sh- well, sharing the material that used to be exclusive yeah. to our show, but, yeah. uh, and, but and I get it. Just cheapens it. it a little bit. I think we're gonna find if we uh, if we keep uh, keep listening through our playlists that uh, Isaac's making the rounds, and he's probably telling that joke on uh, each and every Star Trek podcast he can he can get his grubby little Tasmanian hands. Oh, on. No. Well, <laughs> I, I appreciated this gag. We've only lost six hours. Felt like six years. <laughs> yeah, no, no, very good, <laughs> excellent, uh, and and thank you again. Yes, two hundred and fifty episodes, pretty cool. Uh, it's not a hun- it's not it's not a uh, the the hundreds are the ones where you're like, oh, we should do some special celebration. But uh, well, we're getting there. But this uh, is like one quarter to a thousand. Well, I think this is still pretty special because yeah. we got Jesse joining us, of course, as yes, well as Jesse, is. both Jesses, very very special, Jesse squared. So that's it's it's extra awesome. Square. It's more awesome than a regular old episode. What are we gonna do a third of the way through the three hundred and thirty third podcast? podcast oh what do you mean a third of the way through what a third of the way through a thousand third of the way through episode mm. 333 well that have to be a 333.333 oh. i'm confused wait what, what, what are we going to do for episode 333 okay let's say let's say when our... you get to the 333rd episode mm-hmm. and of... you're a third of the way through it yes. what will you do there so, oh, it's approximately okay. 30 minutes in okay approximately <laughs> approximately oh, damn. um or i don't know dan we might just have to Ruminate start on that. For the, you for the ne- we better start thinking now. <laughs> for the next uh, what, 83 episodes. We got 83 episodes <laughs> yeah. until we got to do that, right? Oh, Mr. Math wow. over there. Mr. Math. <laughs> Usually it's you. That's Mr. Dan's you. Yeah, Dan's Mr. Math. Mm-hmm. I'm Mr. Words. Uh, <laughs> I will be the purest form of conscious life in all of existence. All right. Wow. We're, I, I will be asking later why the fuck he started talking weird. Yeah, all of a right. But anyway, we'll, we'll we'll get to that in a second. Because um, he'd been made. So thank you, Isaac. I think that's it for voicemails and all that other stuff. Other folks out there, if you'd like to send us a voicemail, you can either go to itsgotstartrek.com slash record, mm-hmm. or, and you can just, the app will record it for you, or... You can send an MP3 or whatever audio file uh, suits your fancy to feedback at itsgotstartrek.com. Two truths are possible. That's one of those uh, old-fashioned email addresses. Uh, and they still work pretty well for you know a lot of things. But they're asynchronous, you know? That's the thing about mm-hmm. email. Mm-hmm. It's asynchronous. Asynchronous. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess technically... Uh, WhatsApp or or chatty chats or or texty texts they could they be, couldn't be considered asynchronous depending upon the availability of the they're person flexible you're to. they're like um uh, uh what's the I don't know what the omni uh, omni synchronous um um anton what was auto antonym is that what they were talking about <laughs> auto erotic asynchronicity I don't think we're talking about anything mm. anymore uh Schenectady like, New York like sanction that's what I would use for that. <laughs> minutes I like that word game actually. I, that was the kind of word game that would really stress me out. Yeah, it just seemed oh, yeah, seriously you know? like it's it's fun to watch somebody else. You're like, oh that, oh that's clever, oh that's clever. But if it was my turn, I'd just you know, shit my pants. <laughs> I'd be like, no, I don't want to do it. <laughs> well, it remind me, and there was a Simpsons episode where like Lisa went to like the smart kids house, and Lisa is known to be really smart. Uh, yes, and I then know, they yeah. were like all playing the antonym game where you had to rearrange uh, yeah, someone's uh, the letters uh, of someone's name. Or it something. wasn't that and, wasn't the antonym game. That was the, not the antonym, not an antonym, no anagram. Yes, anagram, the anagram. Sorry, anagram. Yeah. Antonyms. The anagram game would be a little opposite. easier. Yeah, that'd be much Although easier. We would argue because so there would be an argument because yeah. somebody would be like, well, the the opposite sort of love is actually uh, disin- what is it uh, indifference indifference yeah which i mean i, I agree with i'm not trying to mm. speak in a mocking term but, but anyway you, but could see, we... you could see how somebody might yeah. might argue that actually it's not so anyways in the episode anywho we, the anagram you rearrange someone's letters to someone's name to form a new sentence or whatever or whatever <clears throat> or whatever right. and then yeah and that's what it reminded me of 
right. because it's a really difficult nerdy game that like seems like a lot of fun. Yeah, remind him ups uh, that I'd never be able to play. Okay, I, I'm not good at Trivial Pursuit either. Okay, well now we know that. Now, now I won't ask you to play. You just have to play a bunch and memorize the answers. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and play an old version from like yeah, play that, the original one. I know all those. the genus yeah. edition. <laughs> I'll beat you. Uh, okay, uh, it's that's it's, something we both struggle with, <laughs> isn't it? What we, what we do struggle with sometimes on the It's Got Star Trek podcast is talking about Star Trek. So choke um, on that. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, I love sassy Linus. I know. Oh, me too. And I liked when he slurped up his uh, little lettuce or whatever. <laughs> no, I, I think it's I be- really enjoyed that. Because well, uh, Reno said, bamboo. "Hey, bamboo boy." She said, "Bam." So, like, I think it must have been Was bamboo. He bamboo is that the deal? Because I don't know why else she would have said bamboo boy. Just to be hateful. Maybe we should just try to be it. hateful. <laughs> hateful, hateful Reno. Did she ever mention like uh, Bam Bam Bigelow? No, I don't think she ever. I don't think they have Bam Bam Bigelow. What about Bam Bam the uh, you know Barney Rubble's uh, son? No, I don't think Bam they know Bam. Who that is. No, like the internet, they don't have those things in Star Trek. Or because they don't have the internet, so they, they don't had have, they had those. They, things. I'm just saying they just don't know. About it's them. among the list of things they don't have in Star Trek. They don't have internet. They don't have Bam Bam yeah, Bigelow, and they don't have a, a Bam Bam Barney. I son. bet that Kovic guy knows about it. But that yeah. uh, Boothby, oh, sure. Boothby, Boothby was uh, my favorite Martian, wasn't he? Boothby the, knows about the, it. The, the yeah. fellow who played yeah, Boothby. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think he was my favorite Ray. Martian. What is it? I don't know. It's all before my Ray time. Ray Walston. Oh, yes. Ray <laughs> Walston. He was good. Okay. Anyway, uh, you, you guys have successfully distracted me. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to... <laughs> We're trying to Star try, Trek. We're trying to you talk, are angry. Not just Star Trek. We're trying to specifically talk about Through Star the Trek Valley Discovery. of Shadows. <laughs> so, we have pain. now established the episode. First of all, we should note that uh, we've covered all of uh, seasons three through five of Discovery you know, as they aired, um, but we've only covered sporadic episodes we've done the, one season of the one, first two, couple seasons well we season did two. no we've done we, four we done... episodes in the first season yeah four episodes yeah but and now two episodes in the second that's, season. yeah that's i don't think that's possible we, we've done one season two so. because we did the three for the first three episodes for our pilot series, yeah and then we that, started the other the one with mud anyway the long and the short of it is <laughs> Because the story is so serialized, Armageddon. we tend to sort of veer away from it, so we can just jump, you know, jump in and out into more episodic television. But we love Discovery, so uh, when Jesse suggested doing it, it was a great opportunity to come back and and uh, uh, talk about one of these episodes from the second season. However, it was really funny because uh, the o- episode, of course, opens with the. <laughs> With the previously on Star Trek Discovery, oh, and I'm oh, like, yeah. I was like, wait a I, I, I've wait seen a this minute. season a couple times. I'm <laughs> confused as to what's going on. This right. may actually be the most exposition-heavy season of Discovery yeah. ever, which is, I mean, saying a lot, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, I love Discovery as well, but man, usually they're pretty economical with their exposition in Discovery. But yeah, that previously on was like. It's a wow. Lot. They just so many things. So yeah, yeah. It was Burnham's mom is the red angel that was starting to come back to me. <laughs> oh no, and no, like, no. But but is she or not? No. Is she or not? And then like Burnham was like, I accidentally stopped my mom from doing it. Then Amanda Grayson is like, No, you did the opposite. You didn't stop her. You yeah. helped her or something. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, what was the line? It was. I'm gonna find it. Well, I'm and then of course you have all the Clem Fandango stuff going on in the background because oh, he's got real, a, he's man. got a beard now. Uh, and they have this massive green herring which i'm using because it really feels like they're setting up a borg origin yes mm. they right, show right. you these green nanoprobes yeah. in leland's blood and then oh. he says like just struggle is useless yeah. and then it is not a borg thing i all. remember i remember yeah. at the time uh we weren't doing the podcast at the time but when that aired all the chat you know all the, and, and not just that episode you know the episodes leading up it was like this has got to be borg origin or borg related in some fashion um especially when all the time travel stuff it was like oh okay they're gonna go yeah. control will go back in time and like create the borg and then the borg will you know that side so note do you remember when uh tenavik tenavik ten, is, is it ten, tenavik or tenavik tenavik ten, yes yeah, t- it's either of those i think it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, whatever you're two truths are possible um, I, I'm, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Tanavik. Um, I had to keep writing that down. I could I could never remember. Usually when I hear the name once or twice, I'm like, okay, got it, and I write it down. Remember in my notes, I kept having to relook up his name because I could never. It was like Taravik, Taverik. Well, and like, this is not a si- this is not a situation where like Shatner just decides to pronounce it differently than everybody else. So mm-hmm. I was no, just saying, I just I, well for me, I just yeah, I, no, no, it's not one of those situations. Yeah. It was just for whatever reason, my brain was not remembering that name. Do, do you have name reason. blindness? No. No, not or usually. Main deafness. What Were you mean? watching it with with the subtitles? Uh, I was uh, yeah. for the second for the well. for the second run through. I always watch 
subtitles in the second run through. So you do first run through, no subtitles. Yeah. Second run, I only through, watched it subtitles. Uh huh. Tenovic played by Kenneth Mitchell. Kenneth Mitchell, who the the USS Mitchell is yes. named after uh, season five of Discovery. Yeah. Like, oh, he was also like uh, like he was the, a bunch Osiris of Osiris evil scientists buddy, right? Yeah, For yeah. A while. he yeah he was Ar- 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 Aurelio Aurelio. Uh, yes. uh, before that, he was Cole. And then Cole's father, Cole Shar or Cole Shear. I'm not joking, Lee. <laughs> that guy? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Gary, not, Gary, not, not Gary Mitchell. No, Kenneth Mitchell. We, we oh, oh, Gary Mitchell's it. a character, Dan. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm getting Kenneth Mitchell up. is a real life man who recently died of uh, ALS. Oh. Um, and, but he, he also did a number of voices on, uh, he did three or four characters on, uh, on Lower Decks. Um, and by all accounts, a great guy. He was diagnosed with ALS while filming uh, Discovery. I think it was maybe even this season. And unfortunately, it progressed pretty rapidly. Uh, but what was great is they created the character of Aurelio for him specifically, and and that it would accommodate him being in a in a chair and not having to mm. um, uh, you know walk around because he was having trouble doing that. Well, what I was saying about uh, Tenovic is that like he was able to like like pull that time crystal apart when he pulled it, he just broke he that it right sh- off, ripped it yeah. right out now do you think that was klingon strength or do you think time crystals are just brittle there's no way for us to know <laughs> uh, not sure yeah. and that lead that's segues, a good question actually and that segues into my next question about uh klingons in this episode those were some calm klingons they were almost vulcan like yeah, like the, the monk, monk, they were the monk the, the klingons monks, the yeah, monk klingons totally. cleric cleric ca- class cleric class well Kling- just cleric class klingons cleric class klingons <laughs> 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 Jess, uh, Jesse, guess we're Jesse. dangerous. <laughs> guest Jesse, uh, you're into you're into the time crystal business, right? What are your thoughts on the time crystal stuff? I I really am, and I appreciate that you have picked that up. Yeah. Um, mostly, I think what I love about it is that it is it's basically the flux capacitor. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. Like, what makes time travel totally. possible? <laughs> right, and you know that because it's called a time crystal. So yeah. like. They don't need to explain how it works. They don't need to explain anything specific yeah. about it. As soon as you say time crystal, it's like, oh, okay, so time stuff. Like, mm-hmm. And Discovery uses it for whatever time stuff they yep. want. Mm-hmm. And so does Strange New Worlds, which I really, really appreciate. And I think that for me... It's such it's almost a cheat code mm-hmm. and like a, a wink from the writers. I'm in love with it. The audacity to just say, okay, now there are time crystals. <laughs> yeah. So right, yeah. that's what the story is. Uh, like I, I'm totally here for that. I, the discovery is now in possession of a raw time crystal. <laughs> we might be getting our hands on some raw time crystal. Raw, raw time crystals. Raw. Raw, raw and time. wriggling. Time will tell. <laughs> The thing about this, he had that di- voice too. Tenovic and uh, and Computer Gant had a uh, had those weird. Voices. Well, Tenovic was just more deep Klingon. So voice, this is not not, not jangly uh, well, robot. Right, okay, so this is Tenovic. Time will tell. Right, and then um, Time. what was the other one with uh, Gant? I don't know. Oh, <laughs> you were the one who was clicking the buttons. Um, That's your. Oh, oh, it's this one. I will be the purest form of conscious yeah, life yeah. in all of existence. Time will tell. I, I, I just noticed that. It's kind of similar. I, I hear the similarity, although yeah. I think there's a different oh, vibe. Oh, yeah, there is. There's a little bit. A little bit. Uh, Sounds more like that than like, you know, data or something. Yeah. Like. No, no. With the time crystal thing, what's funny in this, it, it, it's it's a cute in this episode because- Like a meat cute? No, it's it's a it's an a, it's an acute representation of uh, of uh, of a uh, not not conflict. There's a sort of a dissonance between the two stories that are going along because the time crystal story, as Jesse was saying, is just this like it's a MacGuffin-y, like time crystals and it's magic. And oh by the way, like if you if you take it, then you pat your, your future's your future. Uh, That's, uh, oh yeah, that, I that doesn't make the, any sense I'm, to say that, but we're gonna do that because time crystals are dramatically we've awesome. Make I was Captain I, Pike I, look I'm, more bad. I made that a note actually. It's like with that time he was like, Yeah, if you take yeah. the time crystal, you can't go no, back now and then now, back. now your future's sealed. It's like why? But compare that to the other story, which is this super convoluted like nanites and control and the uh, section thirty one and uh, you know there's oh, yeah, there all, section thirty one like, was thrown in you're there. Like, I have no idea what's going on there. I'm interested. The actors are all like saying their lines like all in like in, <laughs> in an engaging fashion, but I'm sort of confused as to what's going on. I mean, partly because you know I haven't actually watched the rest of the season for about probably a year and a half. Um, Spock was talking about nanobots containing ferromagnetic materials. Yeah, and, yeah, and then they're using mag- like all that stuff. But Iron. it was just funny when you put the two stories together 
And it's this mythic, everything's just mythic, like just believe it because we're just, we're making a point here. We're telling a tale. And then there's this whole other, like you got to follow every single fucking detail about the signals and the red angel. Oh, and the the signal thing, I was, I was thinking that, um, I also didn't think about this until just now. There were seven signals that they had to follow. That's kind of like in parallel to the last season of Discovery where they had, instead of signals, they had clues. Yeah. And the fourth fourth season where it was not, it was sort of, you know, they had Mm -hmm. to like hop around to certain places. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it was very video gamey. Uh, we are yeah. just about up on a break. Dan, do you have uh, something clever to play? You, sometimes you like clicking something. Sometimes you're like, let me let me click this button while we go into break. You gotta have a time quote or something, right? right? Yeah. I do think. you have a quote about like time? About like how it's time to time to take a break? Um, the power to manipulate time is a weapon unlike any other. All right. That doesn't well, really have anything to do with breaks. I mean, if, so. that's, if that's what we have to go out with, we could, we could do that. <laughs> do you have anything I else? apologize for the interruption, but the <laughs> captain needs us. How about that? <laughs> no. The captain good. needs us, so we got to take a break. All right. Did I apologize they, for the interruption, but the captain needs us. Did they make any reference to peeing or pooing or taking a drink? I doubt it. Um, oh, uh, peeing or pooing? Yeah. Hmm. I'm not sure. Uh, what about the what cappuccino you, one? I'm what what about sure. the Jet Reno cappuccino one? I'm How not, about that? I'm not sure about that. He came espresso. back from the dead and his name rhymes with poo. <laughs> oh, All that's right. right. That'll work. Nice. Uh, oh, wait. Are you talking? Or wait, wait. Are you talking about? Double down on the espresso, kid. Is that what you're talking about? Okay. Well, audience at home, pick one of those and laugh at that. <laughs> yeah, I know. We announced each one. <laughs> Instead of like timing it right, no, we no. just like gave you a selection for you to decide which one you want. Use your home time crystal kit and just 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 pick the one that 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 works the best. I don't know that any of them quite work, but anyway, just pick the one that works the best. We will be right back. <laughs> he came back from the dead, and his name rhymes with poo. <laughs> All right, we're back. back. All right, that was just a sort of an environmental sound effect. Thanks, Dan. You have any more of those? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. I love Discovery Klingons. I know mm-hmm. yeah. that it was a point of contention among the fandom. I, I think especially in season two, once they had yeah. their hair back, you know, it was like, Made all the I'm difference. here for this. They're, yeah, they're Klingons. Yeah. Like, they sound like Klingons. Tenovic is like the uh, Klingon with the clearest enunciation, yes. I think maybe in the history of Discovery, Yes, which I really liked. And it makes sense because he's the one like explaining everything. The uh, the pillar of the present is inscribed with Klingon runes mm-hmm. that translate to hindsight is twenty twenty. Yes, which yeah. I thought the pillar <laughs> of the present. Do you have what it said? You probably don't have what it said. The the weird little thing he the, the phrase that, that Jesse was referring to because I oh, remember yeah, listening to that because you're right. It it is hindsight is twenty twenty. But I remember like pausing it and be, my brain being like, how the fuck do I parse this? Oh wait, I put a few of them, a few of these things. Is this one of those ones where you do it in a random order and we're supposed to? Guess? No, no, no. This is just going to be an order. This I kind of like that by the that way. It's funny because I don't actually know what the, remember the order. I just put them in the order that I, I like the best. But that was the, the new game last week that we did where I yeah. guess the order. As it no, appeared in the you, episode, you, you chopped the lines up and then just rearranged them. Yeah, and then I really enjoyed that. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll remember that for the okay. future. All right, we'll play whatever this business is. Let's okay, see. so this will be a few, a few All sounds. Right. The present is a veil between anticipation and horror. Lift the veil, and madness may follow. All right. So that's not what I was referring to, but, 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 but I do, yet. but I do like that. Li- no, no, I'm just yeah, saying yeah. that's not the line I was thinking about. <laughs> no, but, well, but I love that line. Okay. because it freaked me the fuck out. Okay. It's a scary thing to say to a motherfucker. It is. It is. The past, the present, the future are all equal in their presence. They enter with conviction. Always. Oh, wait. That wasn't the right they one. They leave broken. Always. When the future becomes the past, yeah. the present will be unlocked. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, right? yeah, that's the one. Yeah. I liked it. I was just like, I was like, huh? Yeah. Do I need to smoke more marijuana yeah, to, kind of to understand this? It's like, what's going on here? You have traveled far for nothing. But the acting is so good. And by the way, I took issue with that because I mean, maybe he doesn't know, but they got a spore drive, so they didn't really you know, seem to travel that far at all. It wasn't all that bad. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's he didn't not know. not new to Star Trek, where you're like, man, they're just like bouncing around wherever the mm-hmm. fuck they need to be. They they're right, they're right there. Um, but I really like the delivery by by uh, Kenneth Mitchell. That Tenovic's lines were they were just interesting. It was like really engaging. It was an engaging character. I I kind of like. Doug, the reimagining of the Klingons, too. I mean, like, whether or not they're 
stray too far from original Klingons. Just looking at the, their design itself, I really, in, in, I, you, I, I, you I didn't mind it. Enjoy how they speak. I, I enjoyed it. Um, but it was interesting. Well, you and like I, the Tulampu and all yeah, that. Tulampu. Yeah. Kalish. 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 And Dorian the Pooh. not Um, but um, and I mentioned this before. Uh. It, see, it seems like in the last couple seasons of Discovery, they like tried to like distance themselves from Klingons as yeah. far as they could. Zero Klingons. They mentioned them like yeah, a couple really times, weird. but we never saw them again. And that was probably, I'm guessing yeah. that was done on purpose. And even the mentions probably, were yeah. minimal mentions, sort of like oblique, like, barely, oh, that's, that's Klingon territory or something like that. I mean, Discovery is dealing with a lot of shall we call it negative attention from yeah. certain quarters of yeah. the internet at all times anyway. Mm-hmm. So I could see them being like, you know what? Let's, let's just cut one of these off at the knees yeah. at least. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm and there's w- plenty of other characters to play around with. Do you think they went to the future um, in later seasons? Because like, I think originally a lot of people were speculating that the new newer Star Trek, when Discovery was going to be new at the time, they were like, oh, maybe it'll take place in the future. And then they, some people on the internet like expressed dissatisfaction that it was going to be like an earlier um, Federation Starfleet thing. Now they went to the future. I'm wondering if that's in response to fans like wanting a future Star Trek. I don't know. I guess we'll never know. No yeah. Well, I mean, you know, also there were a lot of like a lot of complaints. So, you know, in a couple episodes here, they're like, okay, fuck you. We're going, we're going to the future where we could just all do all this <laughs> <Yeah>. new stuff. <laughs> um, uh, you know, and I know, you know, to people have different opinions on on the stuff going on in the future but i thought it was fun you know and a, a fun challenge for the writers as well as opening up a lot of avenues for them because you know they could sort of free themselves from the a lot of the lore and it had been a while since i'd gone back to see any of uh, seasons one or two so um having been in that 32nd century time frame for so long it was a little jarring coming back in in time and watching this episode mm-hmm. but it was also really yeah. it was really cool too I love that we can see so much of Anson Mount's Pike yes. that we end up with in Strange New Worlds and so much of Ethan Speck's pa- Spock that we end yeah. up with in Strange New Worlds being built here. Like it's mostly already established. I mean, if I'm being honest, Pike's hair is a little too small. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a little this, flat. It's a little, it's a little, up yet, little no. bit sad. It's a, yes. Kind of upsetting. Yeah. yeah. Um, And I don't think he quite has the uh, Marvel physique. He hasn't puffed out his chest yet. Uh, We will not have this conversation in the presence of Captain Pike. He didn't start working out until after he saw his uh, future being turned into a horrific monster. (laughs) 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 You can can see. Oh my god! (laughs) You can see where they would look at these performances and go, "Hey guys, I I think we can build a show around this." Like. Pike's face when he is watching yeah. Klingon mom and dad fight yeah. at the table is, great. is so expressive, and he's like, you can see him like just wanting to jump in, and eventually, oh, I'll go, I'll go, it's okay. It's hilarious, yeah. and I mean, he's so charming. I mean, it, it's it just it does jump off the screen. Uh, but I think the other thing that works is that Anson Mount, he's such a presence, but at the same time, he's not like uh, he doesn't steal the attention away from everybody, right? Like, yeah, um, the other characters he in the shares, scene, yeah. yeah, it's every everyone's benefiting it from it all together, and he's just doing his part. Um, and and then you get to see him in all these interesting uh, situations, particularly in this episode where when he goes to Boreth and he and he and first of all you see the little uh, CGI guy walking up. I don't know if you noticed, it's very yeah, subtle. Yeah, I, I was wondering. It's, that's supposed to be Pike. It, it's Pike walking up, and it's funny because we think of modern Star Trek as as having really good CGI, and most of it is, and most of it in that shot was, except for this like weird. <laughs> it looked like an Enterprise era CGI uh, mm-hmm. Suliban character, like so awkwardly shambling up these yeah, stairs. And his head is his um hood was down while he's going up but when he knocked yeah. on the door his hood was up oh, i don't know if that's a continuity error but i would think that if yes. you're a continuity error or, or it could be a continuity error you're very yeah. you're very much right i don't or, think it could be or or a continue a continuity <laughs> error it could be a, it would be a conway twitty error no conway twitty um ladies and gentlemen <laughs> conway well. twitty there was an interesting fade uh in to that scene it was a close-up of saru's face it's like cra- scraggly nooks and cranny face <laughs> And it like and it like uh, blended into the cr- it's like, a, rocks. like an English muffin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like and it and blended in with rocks, which was like a blend between what Mordor and Mines of Moria or something like that. Yeah, it was, it was like kind of like both of those because it was fiery like Mordor, but it had they call it a mine. But then they had like like bridges and rock things everywhere, like the mines. It, it's got it had a lot of and low, they had some Lotor vibes. They had that yeah, and they had that second fade where like 
Pike reaches for the door, yes. and then it fades to the rest of the same shot. Yeah, yeah. and was I was weird. like, "What is hell? Why would they do that?" Oh, it's a time thing. Yeah, okay, I get thing. it. Yeah, it's no, a time it, thing. it was clever, but it was it was it was weird. And and we've been to Boreth before. Uh, the Boreth was first seen in uh, TNG's Rightful Heir, which was the episode where they, uh, oh. I guess, it's these same clerics, monks, they uh, try to uh, clone Kalish. And and install oh. him as the um, um, uh, leader of the, the Klingon, you know, on the high command, high council. And then Worf mentions hanging out at, at Boreth after the uh, Enterprise D is destroyed in generations. That's, yeah. Um, yeah. I think he mentions that. I think it's in the way of the warrior in Deep Space Nine when he first comes on board in Deep Space Nine. He mentions that they were like, O'Brien or somebody is like, "What have you been up to?" And he was like, "I've just been chilling, chilling at Boreth." Um, Did we we talked about that? Uh, I th- yeah, we did Way of the Warrior. And Jesse, you alluded to this earlier uh, in Strange New Worlds in Equality of Mercy, the alternate Pike, alternate universe Pike, future alternate yeah. universe, sexy old daddy Pike. A sexy old daddy remember Pike. Remember wearing the monster maroon, you know, uniform? Yeah, 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 he, yeah. he goes to Boreth to get a time crystal to go back in time to tell Pike to, you know, y- y- don't don't avoid getting all messed up in the face. Because <laughs> otherwise everything goes to shit. Huh. Remember? The time crystals. And, it, and it's kind of a, a retread of the exact arc in this episode, which is yeah. like... What if you knew your fate? Would you still accept it? And Pike gives this great little speech to himself. You know, I, b- I believe in service and sacrifice and love. Mm-hmm. And you're like, damn right. We yeah. love Starfleet. And he accepts his fate. But so many people when Strange New Worlds started were like, I, I, I think they're going to change his future. Yeah. They're going to change his fate. And they're like, no, all right, fine. We'll give you a whole episode about how we're still not planning yeah. to do that. And by the way, I, you know, something that always perplexed me a little bit about that uh, uh, argument or that desire that people have. Um, and there's a lot of arguments like, can you do it and stay within canon? First of all, you can do anything and stay within canon because they're clever writers, but they don't need to because it was already resolved in the menagerie. He gets to go back to the planet right, and, and right. you know, right. maybe you might say like, oh, wouldn't it be better just to cure him and then he can go do whatever he wants. But I don't know. And at least in the menagerie, he seemed to be like totally down to like hang out with the Telosians and, and do his thing. Um, so he already has a relatively happy ending. Well, and the future from that point is unwritten yeah like true he, anything could happen to him after the menagerie yeah. and we just haven't seen that yet and you know i think for people to assume that like that's his fate and it's bad yeah. is kind of missing the point anyway yes. where it's right. like dude you know having your life change in that way doesn't mean you now have no reason for living exactly <laughs> and, and and it's there's a, there's a sort of a moral message a citizenship message but it's also again it's that myth mythological side of the storytelling you know sometimes star trek's more sci- sci-fi sometimes it's more like no we're telling sort of a grand archetypal tale uh, of uh, some sort and it's like yes accepting your fate in order to do the right thing right because that's what he's doing right it's like the choice is oh you don't yeah. you don't have to have that fate but if you don't then all this terrible shit will happen to all these other people and um, the klingons are all like damn dude yeah well that's the thing is denovic <laughs> is all like whoa that's rad yeah here here's the time he's a crystal solid dude <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he like cr- crunch just rips that fucking time crystal yeah. right out of that fucking rock time will tell yeah <laughs> Oh, the side note, you mentioned Kalos, and that reminded me of, that, that reminded me of another line in okay. this. That, in this episode? In this episode. That you're looking for? Uh, you're looking for it in your buttons? In my buttons. In your array of buttons? I'm going to play this. buttons. All right. Symbol of Kalish, namesake of Konos. He says Konos. Konos. But they, and I've right. brought this up in the past, that it's, that it's spelled like it Konos, but they always pronounce it Kronos. Yes, right, I right. agree. And I prefer Kronos myself. Sounds Kronos better. sounds cool. I mean, to be honest. But I then it sounds like time. I gotta, I gotta tell you, I kind of prefer, yeah. prefer k I prefer K-less. K-less! Because, you know, it used to always be k now it's K-less. I like that Ash Tyler drops it super casually. He's like, oh yeah, it's a monastery of Kalish. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like, like, no, no, it's no, like no, that no. friend you have that goes to Spain and when they come back, you're doing that fake <laughs> list, like, right? Uh, yeah, I was just hanging out in Barcelona. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're like, come on, man. You're not from there. <laughs> Um, you're talking about uh, Ash Tyler, uh, Shazad Latif. Clem Fandango. Yes, it is really, really hard not to uh, mention or even think about Clem Fandango uh, when he Clem comes H on screen. Fandango. 
Yeah, okay, so for people who are unaware, I, I pity you, but, but but for the people who are unaware, <laughs> Get educated. Uh, we, uh, uh, many of us previously knew uh, Shazad Latif as the character Clem, Clem Fandango, Clementine, Clem, Clem H. Fandango on uh, the television program, the British television program Toast of London with Matt Berry in the lead. It's one of those uh, shows, it's hilarious. Some of, <laughs> Humans. Some of, you, some of you will not like it. <laughs> there's, pl- there's plenty of people who will not like it, but for me, it's one of the funniest things I've ever fucking seen. Dan has, hasn't made it past the first episode. Yeah. Or, well, I'm not I'm, sure if he's, if he's finished the first episode. No, I mean, I've not declared, I never said that I don't like it. I like Matt Berry. It's Barry just a, it's like a little it much. It's much. You and thought like, it was a little much. Yeah. And then I tried to which watch, and I, I like tried it. to watch Snuffbox, and that was like, oh, uh, Snuffbox, yeah. is, <laughs> Snuffbox is great. Snuff I know they're all great shows. It's just I need to be in a. Sometimes I need to be in a certain mood to get through snuff some boxes. Of the, definitely yeah, shows yeah, yeah, yeah. a little. Dan, much. have you watched all of Garth Marenghi's Dark Place at least? No, no, no. Yeah, no but I know oh. of it because these guys talk about it. I know. I, I got. I'm. It's just, it's shameful. I need to catch well, up. So on these the things. thing about Garth Marenghi, Garth Marenghi is one of those shows where I love it. I, I can't be mad at people who don't like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you don't I like that. it, I, I, I'm going to be like, you know what? That's fine. Uh, and it's sort of like, so, a, it's like a spectrum. Cause there's some shows where you're like, come on, how can you not like this? It's charming. But like Garth mm-hmm. Marenghi is, it's, that's pretty, well, the <laughs> pretty first, intense. The first time I heard a snuff box, my older brother was watching it. And then like, he was watching like an episode, the episode went over and he just put his hand on his head. He went, <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then he clicked play for the next episode. Yes, Cause it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. I was like, "What is this show you're torturing yourself?" Jesse, with? <laughs> Jesse and I were hanging out, and I was like, uh, "I was like, hey, you want to see this show, Jesse?" And I just, I was like, "Oh, we'll pop on the first episode." We we watched all six <laughs> yeah, episodes. Well, it's a British <laughs> show. There's not yeah. just, just in a row. Yeah, it's not like there's a much a lot going on. Yeah, anyway, tight, yeah. long story short, Clem Clem Fandango is a hilarious character. Nobody who hasn't seen uh, uh, Toast of London <laughs> is going to understand any of this. But uh, go check it out. I don't know where you can find it right now, uh, but I'm sure you can find it somewhere. Uh, it's it's well worth uh, uh, giving a look see, especially if you want to see Ash Tyler mm-hmm. in a very different role <laughs> mm-hmm. than you're used to him. An agent of control from the future. Because yeah. <laughs> he, it, it is really you're, funny to see me like oh, I, I'm I'm a, I'm a Ash Tyler. I'm a Starfleet officer. To back you up, Patrick. When the uh, lower decks episode, I think it's Parth Ferengi's Heart Place yes. came out. <laughs> yeah. I, I was laughing reading the title and my wife goes, oh, what's funny? And I was like, oh, it's it's a reference to this thing. And she's like, okay, what's that thing? And I was like, oh, it's great. You'd love it. <laughs> and then I paused and was like, actually, I don't know if you would, would love it. It's no. kind of like, you know how like when The Office came to America and she's like, just show me the intro. And I showed it to her. She's like, <laughs> looked at me like she had no idea who I was. And I was like, <laughs> she's like what are you showing? All right, what we, is this? <laughs> we don't have to watch it. It's okay. Never mind. It's got but, I, I didn't like Ash Tyler the first time that I saw yeah. Discovery. I was like, I, I can't dig on this character. And yeah. I've definitely softened on him on rewatching the season. Well, his um, arc I is just, was, his arc is bananas. It's a weird arc. It yeah. really is. It's very, very wacky. Yeah. But once you understand the whole arc, mm-hmm. you kind of come to appreciate what he is playing to more i yeah. think because it's it's diff it's got to be difficult to do what he's doing yeah. like it's uh, so weird they, they also did that thing uh in the first season where before ash's uh true identity uh as uh valk was uh revealed they didn't even use his name for the for the Vok, for Vok. They used uh, he used his father's name. So they actually disguised the fact that he was playing two characters by 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 using a separate name, which is very unusual. You have to like sign all sorts of special forms and stuff to do that with the SAG <laughs> SAG union and all that. Um, so yeah, I, I'm I'm with you there, Jesse, because like I was kind of like, what what exactly is going on here? And what I still don't know with that character is how much of that arc was thought about ahead of time. Certainly a certain amount must have been because like I said, they, you know, disguise some names and stuff, but I don't, I don't know. It's, 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 it's not clear to me that it was entirely coherent all the way through. Um, but Shazid Latif, he's a good actor. Uh, he's a charming person. So he was able to, you know, carry you through some of the, the scenes that uh, he's, they're just talking a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> You're just like, okay, I guess they're just talking nonsense at each other, but it's kind of cool. You know, I guess something's going to happen. 
Um, and he, yeah. and in this, and this particular episode, once he grows a beard mm-hmm. and he's done all, you know, he's got all this involvement with Laurel and all that. It's, it's becomes a little bit more interesting. Cause at least there's, you know, if you, if you, if you have enough plot line, at least there's something you can think about. Right. Laurel's always cool. Yeah. Cause she just always sounds so strange. Yeah. I love Laurel. Yeah. Me too. She is one of my favorite Klingons ever. Totally. She is played by Mary Chifo. Who is the daughter of the Sparkle Motion Lady Whoa, from yes. Johnny Darko? Her. I didn't know that. That's awesome. Yeah, I didn't know that. I, I mean, I knew yeah. Mary Chifa was awesome just from from watching her act, Sparkle but, uh, Motion, and seeing her in interviews too. And by the way, apparently yeah. Kenneth I'm Mitchell. Trying to question your dedication to Sparkle Motion. <laughs> we, yes. <laughs> we talked earlier about Kenneth Mitchell and and how he was diagnosed with ALS, and it turns out that uh, Mary Chifa was the first person he told on the crew uh, or on the cast and crew uh, when he found out, and she helped him figure out how to announce it to the production team you know you know how to what the best way to do that was so mm-hmm. she's clearly very well respected by her by her colleagues and she has all this presence and again that's what works is when you see her and uh ash tyler and pike all in a room they're, they're all these like pretty strong personalities particularly laurel and pike but they are able to you know they, they they're simpatico right they, they can they can uh, stand up to each other and, and no one's stealing the spotlight it's really impressive. Really? This episode, I mean, just this single episode, it kind of made me realize like how dedicated Discovery was to being, you know, really playing in the Star Trek sandbox. Like, here's an exterior shot of a planet and a moon, and yeah. here's an exterior shot of a ship, and it's moving around. Like, there's so much Star Trek in this, and it, it really especially on a rewatch, it really hits you like, oh yeah, this is Star Trek to its core. And I, you know, not to bring up those whiners again, but the whiners are always like, it's not Star Trek. It's not real Star Trek. I'm like, dude, all the pieces are there. Oh yeah. They just, it's they just also have time crystals. Like, <laughs> and, and, relax. And, and you, I, I find I look. I liked I liked uh, Discovery right from the beginning. However, you know, b- b- lots of c- critiques here and there. Particularly, you know, you mentioned earlier, Jesse, the whole exposition thing. We talked about yep. uh, in, in our, when we talk about the the uh, the pilot. A lot of people love the pilot, the first episode, the Vulcan Hello, and I like a lot about it. But there are scenes in there where I'm like, this is so aggravating that they're just standing here for two minutes, just just <laughs> talking at each other to explain the plot, and they're not showing us the plot and everything they're talking about sounds great but they should be showing you know so there there have been issues here and there and some pacing and changing of uh, showrunners and all this other stuff but overall it's been very very entertaining and uh, they've done a good job with it but the star trek stuff like when you go back and look at it now it just feels like a part of it right like all this stuff that yeah. when you're watching a new series and especially after there's like a 14 year break in star trek and your brain's all trying to process it you go back and you're like oh yeah no this is totally this is this is all lore well, that I'm familiar with and it's important for the rest of the story. Although they were in a cargo bay at one point and I saw some like f- like hover drones that looked like they were transporting cargo or something because yeah. it's in a cargo but dots. bay. Yeah. But th- I don't they, I don't think those were dots. I think unless I don't think that think those think were so. dots. I just don't well, remember. Did you do you, can, can you tell the difference between dots and human beings? Maybe they were dots. <laughs> I've like could have just been some guys. <laughs> is there a term for like that kind of like when you don't you're when human you're, blindness? Do you yeah, have human, human blindness? blindness. <laughs> right, whatever. <it's... laughs> I know. Actually, I believe there is a horrific uh, neurological disorder. Mm-hmm. I don't remember what it was called, but where you do think people are robots, mm-hmm. where you think everyone's some sort of like shadowy uh, shell. Terrible. Yeah. That sounds like a trip you never came down from or something. Please don't say that. (laughs) (laughs) No, that's the way. It ends. Make me think of that movie Jacob's Ladder, which Um, is a really upsetting uh, (laughs) really upsetting movie. Um the uh the the uh, real quick about the time crystals. I don't know why I thought Time crystals. So there's obviously time Do we have time to talk about the time crystals? There's obviously time travel outside of this this series of episodes and discovery. You can can go around the sun. You can go around the sun a bunch of times, right? But I was thinking like, well, why don't (laughs) Why don't why do they need time the crystals ones. if they if they can go around the sun? And then I was just like, well, you can time use crystals the time cr- forever. Uh, the time crystals offer you more power than like, you know, just traveling around the sun. You can like look in the future. You don't have to go there. You can lock in your future. Sometimes you can some, lock in your horrific future. Sometimes, right sometimes you want to be able to travel like see to the future without having to go there. And if you fling yourself around the sun, 
and and travel you're there you know it's a pain in the ass to get back so time crystals are just like like they, they it's like t- traveling through time with more features you know so that's why yeah. we need the time crystals what other time things have been have there been like well, Q, first class Q, 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 Q. yeah Q sends people well Q is better than a time crystal because he can do whatever what about he wants. like the guardian of forever yeah guardian of forever is a good one now here's another thing is a lot of people were bumming on the name Time Crystal. I'm like, really? Because yeah, it's a real arguably game. the best Star Trek series ever, Deep Space Nine, had the Time Orb. Yes, the yeah. Time and Orb. And they used that to set up the Tribble episode. Like, that's the thing about Deep Space Nine is is what's great is so Deep Space Nine definitely you know the more the sort of real politic, the Time Crystals, realistic in a lot of ways. But yeah, the the core plot hinged on on wormhole aliens and magic orbs that for some reason had characteristics of time or or emotion or whatever. So yeah, time will tell. Time. It's pretty. Good. You could almost hear Tenevik say. Get it at the end of that line. <laughs> they turn around for a second look. Uh, uh. I like the special effects on that plant that grew all fast when they were in the. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the whole part- that was that was like that was, that kind of reminded me of like some kind of. I'll just think of like the first name that comes to mind. Some kind of something that Guillermo del Toro or something mm-hmm. would have. It like had the surreal mm-hmm. look to it. That was pretty cool. Uh, Although the- I'm wondering what those weapons were. They weren't batlets, but when Pike entered yeah. and then he was surrounded by those two guards and they had these like blade they weapons. Cool, yeah. They, yeah, they right. weren't batlets, they were, but I'm wondering if they had a name. They were new batlets. Yeah. New and you. Oh right. Batlets. Said uh, no. said with. A- I, th- I thought everything about Boreth, other than the CGI goofy Pike at the beginning, <laughs> all of it looked great. The production design was great. Uh, walking around, I mean, you really felt like you were in some sort of cool Klingon, I, especially the winter aspect, right? Because you, I don't know, you think of. I thought that was ash, like, like huh? flying down from a volcano. Maybe it was. It looked like snow, though. It had the effect yeah. of like uh, like a Japanese village. Or that's something well. That's like the that. thing is, well, I couldn't tell if it was snow or ash, but like yeah. Pike had the the winter. Yes. On. Right, thought, yeah, but just yeah, regular yeah. Starfleet pants. So I was like, mm. "Are those pants better than the shirts?" Because well, should you not also need winter pants? That was a that was a pretty sexy winter. I guess that's here. why his hood. Was, I guess that's why his hood was down when he was climbing the stairs because he was all close to the lava. Yeah, and then the lava, like, the lava, and then like it's when he, lava, lava. Yeah. When then when he crossed the bridge, he was more in the winter zone, so he had to like put up his. Well, the, that's evidence that it was cold enough. That's, evidence. A, that's like a that's like a tailored jacket which you don't see tailored Evidence! winter jackets where it like where it like went in you know it was like it accentuated his well, broad shoulders well, and then style. sort of like to went in and then flared out a little on his on his hips just a hint of, also so a hint of hip you also don't see too many Star Trek planets with more than one biome. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> really, yeah. yeah, no, I thought it was, it was really exciting. And and as you were saying earlier, Jesse, they really went all out in this episode with the, uh, uh, all the all the outdoor, you know, the ship scenes and stuff. It was something we actually complained about a little bit in the fifth season, which seemed like it was budgetary restrictions or something that they were saving their budget for uh, certain things. They, they There was a lot of wonderful visual stuff in the fifth season of Discovery, but there were also way fewer like ships. Sh- ship shots and you know flying you know things like that this had so many of them and one that i wanted to call out specifically was um the weird shot where uh when uh, uh burnham and spock's shuttle leaves the shuttle bay where it the shot was as if the camera was like bolted to the like the the right nacelle yeah. and it just follows out the shuttle bay and then you see the ship it was it was a peculiar but really interesting shot and it reminded me that particularly early on but all throughout the series discovery sort of made a name for itself by by doing like weird shots you know sometimes they were aggravating because mm-hmm. it was like too spinny or too upside down or or whatever but they were trying and i thought it was really fun how they they would do that and this was just that was the one really good example here where you're like whoa it's sort of disorienting but in a in a in a good way and most importantly you know the geography it like helped you help define yeah. like you're like i know exactly where everything is and this is giving me information as to what's going on i was a little confused as to why they went out there because what they said was they said uh the ship checked in 10 minutes past the hour yes. so it had already checked in so why but did they, 10 minutes past w- the hour but 10 minutes past the hour but it still checked in so but it, why but did, 10 minutes but the why it, they would check on it if it hadn't checked in at all so once it checked in even though it's late they would get a stern talking it's to suspicious. but why did they why did they need Need to go out there because it's it's suspicious but then how did, it, how, did it, how did it check in at all with all those dead bodies everywhere like wouldn't they have noticed control because control yeah. had taken over because gant yeah. gant was available as a meat as puppet a, 
yeah, terrifying I mean, homunculus. Yeah, well, I, mean, yeah, yeah, I, mean, right. I understand like like the logistics of how it happened. I was just confused as to how they knew something was up. They were suspicious. Burnham was suspicious. They were going. Did they to check in with control? No, they checked in with a dis- Discovery well, or whatever. So, Ash was suspicious, yeah. I think, and they didn't... and they they knew that he would you know communicate yeah. that to Burnham. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it was a, and, it was a trap. Yeah. So it was a trap. Okay, yeah. so we're gonna go with that. The whole the whole idea Some was mystery. get yeah. get them get them concerned. They know that they're trying to you know to distract them. Yeah, and the, and the thing to remind folks they are all Section Thirty One shifts. Yeah, that I think they yeah you know, they do a pretty good job of explaining in the behind the scenes or not behind the scenes in the last time on. But the the whole thing with the second season was that Discovery got fused with that that uh, Sphere data. Mm-hmm. That Sphere data, we're told. If uh, control gets its hands on it, then it takes over the universe and turns the universe into like a nanite slurry or something like that. So whatever happens, they can't let let control get get a hold of discovery and the and the sphere. I, I like how Burnham was getting really impatient with the signals. Like early in the episode, she's like she goes like I'm asserting that waiting around for these signals yeah. to provide us with the answers has proven to be a colossal waste of time. And then later on, Spock's like I understand your need to pursue Leland, but you must not dismiss the importance of the signals in defeating control. And she goes. How have the signals done anything to protect us against control so far? So she's about had it up to here. Up to here. With yeah. those, with, with with these damn signals. For the audience at home, Dan has placed his hand. Could you do that again, Dan? Just sorry. Um, is it above your head or, or just above? His forehead. Just above. Is it like above your hairline or yes. just above your head? No, it's it's that's how up to here it is. It's above my hair. It's above his. And Dan has a pretty strong hairline. So <laughs> thank you. Right, well, it, you know. It's no Captain Pike. No, yeah. no. Fun. I would I would <laughs> never even. I gotta be real. <laughs> no, I'm gonna agree with but you. But how many people pull that off? Right? Well, I'm glad you're and being it, honest. Otherwise, I wouldn't believe any compliments you threw. That <laughs> and well, see, that's why I do it. Mm-hmm. And the interesting thing about that, Dan, is that she's kind of trying to make the opposite case that pike uses where he's like i don't think this is a trap because otherwise why did they have us help the people on terra yeah. like yeah. i'm choosing to believe all the good things about this yeah. right it really is a dense episode yeah mm-hmm. and it's impressive you know in retrospect mm-hmm. how quickly it moves along and, and does what it needs to do uh and speaking of moving along and doing what we need to do do you know what we need to do dan uh, do we need to like do 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 what Jesse said? Well, I don't. Well, I can't speak for <laughs> you, or I can only speak for myself. I don't need to do do, uh, and I don't know what Jesse, Jesse, or you think. But we do need to take a break. Okay, is that okay? Yeah. All right. We'll take a quick break, and when we get back, we will conclude our discussion of Through the Valley of Shadows. Oh. Be right back. Hangnail. Okay, we are back. We're we back. have re- we have returned from our break, and now we're ready to finish our conversation about this television show. Humans, <laughs> you have thirty minutes. Um, so, I mean, we touched on this a little bit, but um, the the whole time crystal thing is is it's sort of a standard monkey paw story, right? Mm-hmm. But it's it is really well performed. It's fun. It's well performed. This this is the storyline that's the more interesting of the two. I'm still engaged with the other story with the control story uh, just because it's like, Oh, it's so complicated. It must be interesting. But this, but this one is the opposite in that it's a very simple story. It's fairly trite in a lot of ways, but because it's Anson Mount, because it's Ken, Ken, Kenneth Mitchell and just the, the way the, they put it all together uh, for me, it works really well. I'm not joking, Lee. Yeah. I, I know you're not joking. <laughs> um, there was another point that I was, uh, a little bit confused about when Gant after like uh, Burnham fig- the point in which Burnham figured out that Gant was not really Gant uh-huh. he goes after the battle of the binaries uh, doubt was all I had section 31 accelerated mm-hmm. their threat assessment program to prevent war from ever even starting mm-hmm. sounded like a good idea to me a way to guarantee a safer future it might sound impossible but with control it's not an impossibility so she looked up after he said a way to guarantee a safer future, as if that was the line that set off an alert in her I head. thought it was the line after that. That's it's what po- I thought, too. It's possible. No, no. And I watched it a couple of times. The line after that, uh, she starts, that, then when she, she really starts acting, but she looks up all like like uh, suspiciously mm. when he says, a way to guarantee a safer future. Yeah, and, and so I was a little bit like, that was one line too soon, I felt. What I, what I'm, what I don't recall, mm-hmm. what I don't recall is whether, I do, I do remember that the whole deal with control 
role is it was some sort of offshoot of it was it was kind of like the uh you know uh tony stark business mm -hmm. you try to save the world and the thing you create ends up like destroying the world kind of thing yeah thank ultra you. ultron business mm -hmm. uh you are in pain so what i can't i i don't recall if that's if a similar phrase was used to describe sort of the oh, ultimate yeah, maybe goal of control callback. so it could be that that was referencing that but if it was it's uh, lost on me yeah. <laughs> here jumping into it and it also shows one of the uh the drawbacks there's lots of pluses to serialized storytelling but there's also some drawbacks which is uh, if you're relying on certain emotional cues based off of a an obscure reference from earlier in the season eh, maybe it's not well, gonna, in a way, hit as, uh, hit as one as of the things that <clears throat> excuse me one of the things that makes me agree with you there dan is that if you think about it that's the exact same mission that burnham is on mm -hmm. is oh, to yeah. guarantee <laughs> a safer future right. <laughs> like uh -huh. That's what she's there to do. So I think you're right that it felt like it was maybe one line too early. And also, like, come on, Burnham, be more surreptitious. Like, reach for the phaser as you're looking up right <laughs> right. Now, instead yeah. of doing that and then reaching for dramatic. the phaser. Like, yeah, I mean, the uh, way to, you know. a way to save her future, like, everyone is pretty into that. It's just what you say after that to implement that that, that uh, idea is the pro can be problematic. Right. Yeah, pretty right. much everyone offers a safer future. Yeah. <laughs> That's the problem, right, mm -hmm. in general? But here's here's a thing that I think, you know, because I don't... Uh, frequently on Open Pike Night, I play the role of the wide-eyed, glossy-eyed fanboy who's like, I love everything about every <laughs> Star Trek, which is mostly true, but... This guy, Gant, once he's taken over and, you know, even with the goofy robot voice, yeah. I actually, I think he's a better villain than Leland, oh, yeah. who is like way too arch all the time. Yeah. <laughs> way too arch. And also there's something about uh, uh, Leland that, I don't know, he, he's got, it's hard to describe, but like, you kind of want to just hang out with him. And, and, and even when you know he's a bad guy, you're like, I don't know, he seems, you know. He's kind, of, he's kind of a rascal, whereas Gant, yeah. really, I mean, he was like, really like, fuck, this guy is, he's scary. He's doing some Terminator he's shit. Dude, he chokeslam yeah. Burnham. Yeah. yeah. It hurts like a bitch. I will say yeah. that for my money, as much as I like most of the production design in this episode, uh, and as much as I like the concept of the nanites spilling out of his uh, open wounds, yeah. it was, I don't know. I don't i don't know that they pulled it off very I wasn't, well. And I wasn't very clear on their way they trapped him. It they was all snaky and bloopy, and I was like, ooh, we're scary nanites. And, and the, way, was, they, the way they trapped him was a little bit like, kind of like, huh? I guess it was, uh, we'll create a dummy startup system, something large and unaffected. Yeah. The AI will be drawn to the dummy startup system. It'll enter the dummy system system like a lion drawn to fresh meat and then we'll close the door behind it trapping it in a cage i mean it's all conceptual obviously yeah, yeah. and it's supposed to not you shouldn't have to deep it's techno babble without the techno really but we know that there are audio recorders on starships yeah. in star trek because captain's logs are always getting made yep. right mm -hmm. so if control has control over this ship wouldn't it be listening to everything that <laughs> yeah. they're saying mm -hmm. all of the effing time? Right. <laughs> like, One would presume. I mean, we're already doing that now. Well, so. and the thing the thing I was yeah. thinking about while watching this is that uh on the one hand, it was it was a scary scene and it was like, oh, this is intense and it's scary to see somebody you 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 knew about and worked with and all of a sudden they're they're possessed. It's sort of that classic sort of possession thing. Uh another, you know, hearkening back to relying on tropes from older stories to, to instill some fear in us. And it worked, but I was sitting there thinking, I was like, you know, it'd be a lot scarier is if this whole control business didn't have Leland, didn't have this guy. If it was just the machines, if it was like that X files episode blood, I think it is where it's just, just the machines are using whatever access they, they're limited, but whatever access they do have, they'll fuck with you, you know, by closing the door on you or chopping your hand up in the, you know, the blender or something like that. Classic. Yeah, exactly. That, that to me, would if, if control just controlled all the uh, computer bits of the machines, but didn't, wasn't able to, pr to possess people. I think that might be a more interesting and more scary story because you can't trust the thing you're trained as a fan to love, which is the ship. Is the computer. You know, the ship is your right. home. The computer is your friend and it takes care of you and it replicates food and makes you mac and cheese and it takes your, it beams your poop out of your belly so you don't ever have to poop because yeah. that's what has to, has to happen in Star Trek. They yep. can beam out babies and they can beam out poops. Yep, they can. <laughs> Both. Well, and they end up, and they end up relying on the same thing for multiple characters, right? We've got Gant, we've got Leland. This a similar thing happens to Miriam, although, mm -hmm. or Arium, I think. Arium, but it yeah, also, yeah. 
it makes a little better sense with Arium at least because it's like part, yeah, she's yeah. part robot. Yeah. Like. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So yeah. it, but you're right. It ends up getting repeated enough to where you're like, oh, okay. And what they, right. were, they were, we could tell that the how much in control they were. The ship had all uh, the orange dots, and the humans had. Yeah. It was like when they showed us <laughs> yeah. all the things that were the under control. Yeah. There were 34 orange orange box mm -hmm. boxes, and then there was one blue box. The one blue box represented what the humans had control. Yeah. So the machine. It's like had, their name should be control. They had 34 <laughs> times the amount of control. Yeah, control. It's on the, the other hand, ah. uh, on the other hand, so those were all apparently Section Thirty One ships, and somebody um, I forget who it was, Reese or somebody, but somebody mentions like, "Oh, that's almost their whole fleet." No, I guess Ash said that, and it was like, "Okay, that's that doesn't sound, that's not like a lot of ships." I guess it's a the lot. One of variable it cannot account for. It's a lot of ships if you're talking about uh, sort of contemporaneous, uh, contemporary, I should say, uh, naval fleets or something. Yeah, but uh, I don't know. It was, it was funny. Yeah. Because he goes, those are Section 31 ships. And Saru goes, there are 30 of them. And somebody goes, that's almost their whole fleet. I'm like, does it have 31? It's got 31. It's a little on the nose. Like, oh, I didn't even catch that. That's hilarious. <laughs> they are all Section 31 ships. Well, and, and, and just to actually to back up, I think one, uh, one complaint I agreed with, even though I was willing to go along with it for this season, because, you know, it was, the season was fun, season two. But the idea of Section 31, the way they represented it as more... More people knowing about it uh, undercuts it a little bit. Them having all these ships explicitly sort of undercuts it as opposed to where, how they were presented in Deep Space Nine, where it was more about, no, they're just scuttling around, you know, little wormy people manipulating existing levers of power, um, which might include ships, et cetera, but not necessarily their own uh, whole starships. It sort of changes the dynamic of how you think of them. And of course, then they sort of, you know, then it goes away. So it was like after the, after this season, it's like, okay, that's uh, that, that version of section 31 is done. Now they're going underground. They sort of provided a little bit of a justification, but eh, I, I, I can kind of agree with the cr critique that may, you didn't have to use, section 31 you could have done this with uh with just regular old starfleet and it still would have been still would have been scary no and they they tried to lampshade it by having i don't i don't remember if it was season one or season two but one character is like have you ever seen a black badge yes and they're like oh yeah it's a section 31 badge and they're like so if you're not supposed to exist shouldn't you not have your yeah. own badge that <laughs> yeah. announces that you exist and, and especially like, a badge that looks so awesome the hell was that you could put that in there but it's it doesn't fix anything. <laughs> it's like when you're like Nova Squadron or whatever. It's like, those guys look awesome. They got that awesome uniform. <laughs> it's like, that's not a secret. It's not like a secret right. society. <laughs> yeah. And I will say one of the common complaints with Discovery is we don't know the crew. And it's like, yeah. well, you don't hear their names a lot. Yeah. Right. But, but we get some great crew life Wonderful in this episode. Yeah. Like. Watching Owo and Detmer fall in love across fall in love across the lunch table mm -hmm. I, just made me so much angrier at season five. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, 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 you know, also this this moment of Reno yes. playing kind of a, a proto Hemmer role, right? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. I'm gonna fix what's broken in people yep. as an engineer, yeah. and I'm yep. gonna be grumpy while I do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got that in my notes. Reno, really I need medical attention. <laughs> Reno is good at fixing things uh, and people. Yeah. Um, Don't screw it up. And I and I love how we know we know she's doing it because she cares, but it's she's also in a position to act as if she's only doing it because it's inconvenient to her <laughs> to have these these two right. people fighting. Right? To it have, hurts uh, like a bitch. Culver, Culver and Stamets is, uh, is just aggravating her, so she's like, "I'll just cure their relationship by <laughs> because otherwise Stamets is going to be no good to me." Um, but uh, you know, I'm just again reminded about how what a wonderful character so, Reno is, and this is early Reno. So I know this was a joke, but do you think non-denominational shuttle parking is like people who aren't affiliated with some kind of like a Starfleet? Uh, like what the fuck does non-denominational? <laughs> I, I think it was. Jokes? I think it was bullshit. <laughs> like it's got to mean. I know it was a joke, but it doesn't mean. Wasn't meant to mean anything. Like it's. I mean, nah. it's just people. It's like when you come. It's like I'm from the the, the this this uh, faction of Starfleet, and the other person's like I'm from this well, faction of Starfleet, and then this these people are like I'm from my own faction, which is no faction, and so that's where non-denominational <laughs> shuttle parking is. I mean, that's as good I think, a theory as any. I think, <laughs> sure. I think regular listeners to the show know that Dan is from his own faction. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> He's, it's the I Borg but, fashion. Yeah. You haven't but brought up also, genocide yet. Not yet. He also said that her wife wanted fewer than 10 guests. Yes. So it's like, 
How, how many, many denominations are going to be represented among and, nine people? And how many <laughs> shuttles? You know, I mean, that's yeah. a max of ten, and and that sounds unreasonable. You expect shuttle? some people to, to shuttle pool, <laughs> you know, or to take a Uber shuttle or whatever the equivalent is in the right, right. Uh, in Starfleet in the future. Engine engineer, not a poet. Well, that's for sure. And Patrick, you had mentioned earlier, and I don't remember if this was actually you know quote on air unquote, but the opposite of love is indifference. We actually get to see that in this episode because Stamets is sitting at the lunch table, like just looking at yeah. Hugh, not care that he's in the same room. And he goes and sits with his new friends yeah. and he's just so upset about it. And it's like, Hugh is having so man, much that's, fun. It's very Those subtle, but it absolutely it's works. It is. And, and it's, uh, you know, I'm, I, we're lucky that uh, Discovery, unlike a lot of other streaming shows, Discovery got to go on uh, for five seasons. It's too bad it got sort of ended after five seasons. I think they were expecting to maybe at least get one more season out of it. But since it went on for five seasons, we got to really enjoy a number of uh, great character arcs. But the Culber Stamets one is is a fantastic one and very realistic. And that's what makes it interesting to watch. Right. You know, um, I mean, Culber was having a relationship crisis because he came back from the dead. Yeah. And it's a funny, goofy sci fi reason. Mm-hmm. But it's also it's got aspects in there where it's like you've had a life event. Yeah, that has impacted you, and That's now true. it makes you confused as to uh, what your status is with your loved ones, right? Um, that's what I experienced is for me alone. That's something somebody can identify with and and making it as ridiculous and sci-fi as he, he died because of some mold business or whatever, you know, like, like it's like, okay, I, I can, I can, it's, it's, it's distant enough from my own, whatever my own personal issue is that I don't have to compare it directly to it, but I can still be influenced by it. That's good Star Trek, right? Mm-hmm. That's like what Star Trek does when it's at its best, uses some sort of sci-fi or fantasy analogy to create space for people to think about things that they might be uncomfortable thinking about otherwise. Um, and yeah, this was, it was, it was, it was cool. This is a cool part of the episode. Of course, again, like we said at the beginning, this is a super dense episode because it's the Culber Stamets stuff. It's the, it's the Laurel, uh, Tanovek, uh, son of none, you know, Ash Tyler stuff. It's the Pike stuff. It's the Spock stuff. You know, and we even get to see Spock's mom at one point. Amanda Grayson. Amanda Grayson. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, um, since Pike sees his future, he must be pretty sure they end up winning. Why didn't he make that point? Mm-hmm. I was thinking about that. <laughs> Interesting. They're like. like you're, you're and he uses it in Strange future. New Worlds. Yeah, and, like, he, and, it, well, yeah, and the thing is, he, he knew, yeah, because in Strange New Worlds, they actually make that a plot point. But here, yeah. they, here they don't yet, because their whole thing is they're worried about whether or not they're going to win against Control. And he's now not only seen a future where he is a higher rank and in a different position and looks older, so clearly some time has passed. Um, it doesn't guarantee that they defeated Control, but hey, it's, it's a good sign <laughs> that he's going to live a lot longer. Yeah. And he's 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 taken the time crystal, which apparently guarantees that future is definitely going to happen. So he should have gone back and be like, "Hey, no, no, whatever. Hey, just decide what to do because whatever we decide to do, it's the right thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> it must be because I've locked in this future. <laughs> I have real life plot armor now. We should use it. Yeah. Oh, speaking of armor, I, I, I for whatever reason, and I'm sure that this is not the origin, but their armor reminded me once again. I haven't me- mentioned Mass Effect in a while, but some for some reason their armor, their space. Space armor was reminding me of something from Mass Effect, mm. which probably is from something else. Are you talking about like a uh, Burnham? They're, they're and Spock white. And... They're Burnham and Spock. Yeah, they're white. Uh, with, their, with the yeah, the stuff. Space Marine. Yeah. Thing. yeah. I got you. Um. Well, and those season five future admiral uniforms mm-hmm. are straight Mass Effect uniforms. Yeah. 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 I was counting, actually, speaking of season five, I was counting um, the amount of, because I noticed I didn't have that many Burnham quotes this week. And then, oh, because yeah, you, 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 were, you were doing the, the fast Burnham game. Yeah, I was. And recording so, the fast because, Burnham stuff. Because in the last season, there was like an overwhelming amount of Burnham. <clears throat> like, that, and I'm not saying that's not a negative. I'm just saying there was, mo- yeah. it was a ton of Burnham. A, a lot stuff. of Burnham and a lot of fast Burnham. A lot of fast Burnham. So, and, and so in this episode, there was only a few uh, Burnhams. And I only managed to notice uh, two that I think would qualify qualify as a fast bur- fast talking burnham and maybe in a one bonus so these are the two so maybe there's still a chance to stop it so maybe there is something in the signals that can help us finish what my mom started yeah that's, 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 those are fast fast talking burnham back then and then here's the bonus 
Send a priority one message on a secure channel to Enterprises XO. Fast talking Pike. Fast talking. Okay. <laughs> Fast talking they Pike. Had, they had clearly not decided that Una's name would be Una yet, yes. right? Uh, like, yeah. Yeah. why would he say it that way? Yeah. Like, send a message to Enterprises XO. Like, dude, right. you know who that person is. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to use their title. You just say their name. It like, was all this yeah. time. Very, very she was dead. Uh, any other major points as we sort of wind things down? Um, we talked about Jet Reno, not Janet Reno. No. Uh, we did discuss the um, the game they were playing, and Jesse, you noted the uh, character development. Hey, Bamboo Boy. Which I, I, I love seeing scenes like that, and yeah, it, it, they ebbed and flowed. Discovery did do them from time to time, but it, that's true of most Star Treks. A lot of Star Treks didn't always they did not always have time for these types of scenes, and so I thought it was really enjoyable to watch. I like I like watching the crew socialize, and so anytime mm -hmm. there's an opportunity, yeah. and especially which I think is even more rare, is watching the team socialize in a way that's really not directly related to the plot, right? So this was just yeah. you know they were setting up the uh, the Stamets and Culber thing, but getting a, getting a little fun in the in the in character development. In the in the process which i really enjoyed mm -hmm. i don't have any other major points but i do have an odd slash end so ah, I'll save oh that. yes i will well i think we're ready for odds and ends because we sure. got a, we got a couple here mm -hmm. um I'll, I'll start and then we'll go to you jesse um one thing that i noticed was um it, there there was all those dead bodies floating around dead uh, bodies everywhere dead bodies floating around in space which was cool and scary and all that that cgi was good right because mm -hmm. i guess it's easier to uh, make a dead frozen mangled body than, than a, it hurts than, like a bitch than captain captain pike walking up some stairs um but at one point and it's just an optical illusion but at one point um there it looked like um the, the way they positioned one of the floating dead bodies it looked like it was somebody just sitting on the nacelle of the uh, section 31 ship <laughs> when they when they were on board it and i and i and i briefly was like oh my god is is this a plot point? Is this going to be like, <laughs> is that the red angel? <laughs> is that somebody just waiting? <laughs> What's going on there? Uh, but then I, I watched it back through a couple times. I was like, okay, now it's just one of the dead bodies that happens to be floating in that position. How are you possible? All right, Jesse, what's it? What's your odd and end? So I have another one that's really small and I may not even bring it up, but did you notice in Pike's terrifying vision of the future, mm -hmm. One of the Starfleet cadets behind glass is wearing that big square cadet badge ah, that we oh. also see on Uhura in the first season of Strange I, New Worlds. I did not so, notice that. What is it? I, it's huge. <laughs> it's a giant yeah. square. <laughs> well, like, spot, well, you got to be for those trainees, you know, you got to be make I it very clear <laughs> that there's a trainee. <laughs> um, um, and then was, the other one is just like, did they have maybe a backup boom mic operator in this episode? Because there were a few scenes where I was like, this is not crispy audio. <laughs> I agree. And uh, it, speaking about Laurel, right? It wasn't just that, like, so Laurel has a certain way of speaking, but it was inconsistent where sometimes it was just no the normal Laurel speak, which is it's a unique enough uh, presentation. But other times it was just like, <laughs> it was it really yeah. sounded like. The, the the teeth were falling out. The false Man. teeth were falling out of her mouth, or something. I don't know what it was, but I, I don't know if I was the only one. I who that forbid before. you to go. Uh, yeah, that maybe was. One that, we will not have this and, conversation in the presence of Captain Pike. Right. That and Saru player. when he's telling Michael, like, "Yeah, go ahead, go on your mission." And yeah. I was like, "He sounds so muffled." And usually, Saru is like the king yes. of enunciation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. Although what was, you know, it was confident Saru, right? And this, this is newly confident Saru because it's not too many episodes before New this, Saru. uh, that he, uh, went through, uh, uh Kelpian puberty and, uh, got his spikes. And, that is a good name. And decided to be all tough guy Saru. <laughs> Two truths are possible. It was another aspect that was, uh, a little bit peculiar and needed getting some adjusting to just in retrospect because again we've been living in uh, the last three seasons where uh, michael burnham becomes the captain and saru becomes her first officer or in other ways is also sort of subordinate all oh, right her. yeah and, and well that's yeah that's interesting I had to here. yeah i had to remind myself that yeah she was his subordinate yeah. and they hadn't gotten quite as close yet but yeah. he was they were starting to like they were starting to chum chum yeah. chum up together but she was and she and again her character development her arc over the series is is it's a significant arc and and she's very clearly this is season two burnham right she is uh 
a little bit more aggressive, a little bit less uh, suffering of fools, that sort of thing. She doesn't have quite need saving, brother. She hasn't she hasn't developed some of the the wisdom that she gets through going through this plot and the subsequent plots where she, you know, she learns a few things along the way. Um <clears throat> jumps into the future. Speaking of um what was the word you used? Uh, uh optical illusions. That's that that, that phrase or I, term. I, mean, I think I used that quite a long time ago. Actually, you well you about 5 minutes ago. I don't know. I think it was that was your first fun. That was I your first was... Uh, nook and cranny. Was you were talking about optical illusion because of a dead crewman on a okay. Cell. All right. Cranny. All right. Um, did Lorel look like she had four nostrils to you? It uh, looked like she had four nostrils to me. She had interesting teeth. Yeah. She's got. Yeah. They gave the they gave the yeah, nucleon on some interesting teeth patterns. I thought they you could also them. almost see like where the prosthetic was yeah, applied. Right. Right. It was, it was a little intense. And Spock had like like pointy beard, a pointy yes. beard, cheek beard going on, like his ears <laughs> or something. It was weird. It was a weird decision for his. I was a little more style. comfortable with the Spock beard this time than when I was first watching through it. I remember being a little like, I don't know. I liked I like Ethan Peck as, as Spock. No, it's uh, def- it's definitely not a criticism on anything. It was just kind of like yeah. interesting choice for his beard. Well, and I was I, I I was a little distracted staring at it because I was like, okay. Is that natural or is that shaved that way? I, or or do they shave it that way on Ethan Peck because they want it to be like that's natural on Spock? I don't know. I could not tell. Like I, I, I stared at it for a while. I couldn't I couldn't figure it out. It's so borderline. But they do I think in this season they somebody calls it out. He's like, Do you have any questions? And somebody goes, Yeah, do you really think the beard is working? <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> Yeah, but the the whole time on the planet, the, the time. The, did you say time? Whole, Are you talking about time crystals? The whole monk time, time will tell. <laughs> the whole monk time. Hindsight is twenty twenty. The whole get monk, it. The whole monk time uh, planet. That was I. I that was like it, it was fun. That was a fun. It was fun to look at. It was it was fun to experience. Totally, yeah. You know, just I've been like, watching. Oh, monk, like a lot of good. I've been watching there. Monk lately. You know, remember Monk oh, on God. USA? Here we go. I think it's it was on uh, Netflix. I guess that means there. we're done. No, no, we're not done. Tony yet. Shaloub? Yeah, with Tony Shaloub. Uh Monk, you know, he's uh his, his wife got blown up. His wife, he's, he's quirky, right? He's quirky. It, it was a good show because it was weird. It was sort of slightly comedic, but then there was all this horrific stuff happened. <laughs> not just Major protein. Not just the business. Bo- not just the plot setup where his monk's, on call for. monk's wife is horrifically blown up in a car bomb. And it was so much worse. But there'd be these whimsical murders, but it would be like somebody getting like chainsawed to death. <laughs> <laughs> Don't screw it up. Um, all right, back to no. the, uh, back no. to the old, or, no, no. original I do, I do want no. listeners to know the look on Dan's face <laughs> when Patrick said monk. And, and Dan said, all right, I think we're done. It was like, uh, like a parent trying to get their kid to leave the fair. Or oh, something. usually like, yeah, the was, best uh, the best look is what when when uh, when Jesse like uh, is like crinkling some snacks or something and Dan, Dan darts him like, like an evil look. Well I just like, thought I just do? thought I'd like like just express like you know no, something I liked good. about the episode because no, you know just good because we're having fun and everything. But I just want to express that there like you know there was some I know, liked it. Yeah. I not liked that, it not that people much. should give a shit about my opinion, but no, like, I, mean, <laughs> I know, I agree. I, I Nor are you in wholehearted agreement. Um any other odds and ends? Um, I don't have. We could create a dummy startup system. Oh, the one thing is, I mean, I you know, I don't know if it's even worth mentioning, but there is a there is a point where there's some super ADR, um, you know, where they record over. Um, it's where Ash is talking to Lorel, and it's a scene where they're just standing there, not talking. You see the back of Ash's head, and very clearly, they went back and recorded. We never even gave him a name, mm. uh, and it's so it's so <laughs> like look. You sometimes you notice these things, and and it's like okay, they decided they needed to give some more information to the audience. But it's funny when it's so forcefully shoved in there when it was clearly what they shot. It just doesn't make any sense, and they're just like, we have to get this information out that they did not give Tenovic a name because later they're gonna hurt, learn his name, and that they're gonna they're gonna be all like, whoa. So the, you know they have to explain that. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, anyway, just you know. Uh, I'm, some some to point out uh, when Lorel said to uh, 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 Ash, she was like, "I have accepted the truth about us. You are and will always be in love with Michael Burnham. I was in love with Voke, 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 yeah. uh, who sacrificed everything." And then she goes, "But that is not who you are." She just told him he's a piece of shit, basically. No, she did not. Yeah, she <laughs> did. Know, she's no, like, no, "That's no. not you." No, she's she was helping like, him. She was like, she was like. She, no, she's helping him. She man. was no. What she said is letting him out of the. 
No, she said Volk sacrificed everything and was really noble and brave and awesome, but that's not you. That's what she said. I'm not, I didn't, I'm not putting these words in her mouth. I get how you're interpreting this. I mean, I'm putting some of the words in her mouth, but I'm just, I'm, I'm, I get how you're interpreting this, but you're summarizing. I believe you're willfully misinterpreting this. (laughs) Willfully. She, Volk, or Ash Tyler is worried because as far as he's concerned, he's Ash Tyler with his implanted memories, but then he learns like actually he's this monstrous Cleon. (laughs) But then why did she add the part like, he who feels, sacrificed he, everything? That's not you. He's worried. He's been worried this season that he's a monster because of this thing that he went through. And she's giving him an excuse to no longer be worried about it by saying, you are not Vogue. I was not, in she's love. not saying you're a piece okay, of let's, shit. Because... <laughs> let's, let's replace the words. I was in love with Vogue, who is very loving and gentle, but that's not who you are, you know? No, like, I, I, no, you know what I'm saying? I, I, yes, I, I get She where said it, not me. I get she's, where you're coming from. She starts it by saying, I recognize that you will always be in love with Michael Burnham yeah. mm-hmm. as a way of alleviating okay. the pressure yeah. on him. Okay, like, no, that's a good point. He's, she's trying to say, <laughs> like, it's it's cool. She's what well, she's not the, the the subtext here is that she's found somebody else that she's hanging out with and she's like, Don't worry, dude, I'm good. I'm the I'm the high the chancellor of the Klingon Empire. I can do whatever. And when the future becomes the past, <laughs> the present will be unlocked. There was a lot of present, unlocked. future, past talk. Yeah, well, you know, obviously you because of the time. It'd be cool if, if you handed him a little gift box as he said that. You hear a little what? If he handed him a little gift box as oh, he said yeah. that, the present, <laughs> the present will be unlocked. The <laughs> and there's one of those uh, annoying puzzle boxes that you can't open unless you yeah. smash it open. Um, the present is a veil between anticipation <laughs> and horror. And Lift horror. the veil. <laughs> And madness may follow. I love those lines. I, no, thought, Tenevik, I thought Tenevik was really fun. Tenevik's great. And, he and seemed like such a not fun guy, but something about him was really fun. It's also yeah. th- that's a that's the type of line where if you if you if you analyze it at all, it doesn't really make any fucking sense, but it just sounds so crazy. You know, the like, past, the present, the so future intense. are all equal all of in them. their presence. All of them are equal. Um all right. All right, I think that's that's enough of that. Uh, we've talked about that episode. The ball good. Uh, Do not leave these sacred walls, that of the Borg good. All right. There, well, okay. I'm glad you played that one. Um, I mean, just some more Klingon words. <laughs> just, you're just squeak. You're just like, no, this, is, this is the point of the show where Dan's like, I got a few extras. You got any others? Yes! Do you have any that you, di- that you didn't play that you want to play before we go to the end bits? Um, I saw you back there. How's that? Was that, a, was that one worth waiting for? I mean, I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to leave that up to the audience. <laughs> well, you must see for yourself. How about that? Was that exciting? I mean... This is one's always exciting, this subject matter. They're coming for the data. They're coming for the data. <laughs> Red alert. Red alert. Red alert. All right. Uh, so I'm enraged. I was, forbid you to go. That was, I love you both. <laughs> Choke on that. Oh. <laughs> indeed, indeed we will. We will all metaphorically... Double down on the espresso, kid. Ch- choke on that, Dan. Um, that was uh, Through the Valley of Shadows, uh, episode 250 of the It's Got Star Trek podcast. That's, we've done a lot of episodes. Pretty I'm good. a regular bloodhound. Oh, yeah. yeah, indeed. All right, so... Hangnail. So, um... Hangnail. Next, Hangnail. Next Hangnail. Week, next Hangnail. Week, Hangnail. Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> I feel so happy to have finally witnessed this in person, honestly. <laughs> next week. Next week, uh, we're all on vacation. Um, ah! <laughs> so so ah! we, we thought... <laughs> okay, we thought, what better time uh, than than uh, we are on vacation, so we had to record something ahead of time. So we thought, what what a be- better time to uh, record <laughs> our second installment of our hit series? It's not Star Trek. No, Uh-oh. it's not. So uh, next week we're not going to be talking about Star Trek. We will be discussing the first episode no. of the hit 1980s television program, Alf. Ow! Alien life form. Uh, got any cat? Got uh, any cat? Willy. Willy. Uh, <laughs> Mel Mac. Kalis. All of that. Ulampu. All that. We already recorded. It's a good episode. Ulampu. We already edited it. There's none of that. There's just mostly, no. uh, you know, uh, you know, chasing the cat and uh, and the kid with the with that. Before with you get up for that final snack, I want you to know I'll be right back. <laughs> ha! <laughs> that, that wasn't in the first episode. No, it wasn't. That uh, was only to commercial breaks. Yeah. Back when, back in the day, when they had those little bumpers between commercial breaks, yeah. like between. 
the show in the break they had like the dude saying like hey don't 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 lose your underpants we're coming back or whatever yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's that's called play kate and jesse that's jesse play kate and jesse. <laughs> um all right uh but yeah no, so next week we're gonna talk about alf you can check it out everyone go watch the first episode of alf uh you can see it in tons of places it's even on youtube amazon prime if you've got access to it, Tubi, it's free. What is it? You don't need an account. I watched it on Tubi, and it didn't even have any commercials. So if you need to find it, you should not have no trouble finding the very first episode of ALF. Watch that. I'm enraged. Rage is the enemy of logic. Then listen to next week's episode. Then after that, we will get back to our regularly scheduled fun Star Trek-y business. And we'll, we'll just keep an eye on our social media and we'll, we'll let you know what we will be discussing the following week. But uh, I, I got to say, as a fan, I was kind of hoping that all of It's Not Star Trek would be food-based yeah. and that maybe well, the second one would be It's Got Mayonnaise. Oh, oh yeah. No. Mayonnaise. Uh, yeah. Tip top. Nice yeah. pronunciation. By uh, the way. Well, and you, yeah, I agree. And uh, now I <laughs> he think knows what's up. We will we will do some more food stuff at some point. The tricky thing is is that uh, so Jesse doesn't eat mayonnaise or eggs or what else? What but other? he does eat it in spoonfuls by itself. No, you know, nope. no, not into that. <laughs> not at so all. he would be a, sort of an, an observer. He's very keen on observing it. I've 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 been uh, cooking up some eggs, and Jesse will be like looming over my shoulder. And I'm like, what are you doing, man? I was just like, he wants some eggs. He's like, fuck no, I don't. No want eggs. He's just like watching the process. <laughs> we almost did a food thing. Just checking it out. But yeah, we'll do a food thing another time. But we wanted to talk about Alf, so we, we talked about Alf. Um, and it's got the whole space thing. Yeah, alien, alien, alien life form. Right yeah. there, you go. That's what you call Vulcans, really. Yeah. Right? They're Alf. Bunch <laughs> so, of Alf. So that's something to look forward to next week in the meantime thanks again jesse thank you for, jesse. for joining us uh thank you, sir. Op- open, my pleasure gentlemen open, thank you, pike, sir. open pike night uh go check it out uh premiere it is the premiere uh well i was about to say strange new worlds uh podcast but really it's one of the best star trek podcasts out there even though they're focused on uh, uh, strange new worlds um so check thank that you, out sir. um as for us, you can, of course, find us on social media, all the social media places at It's Got Star Trek. Uh, website is it's got Star Trek dot com. Uh, you can send us a message at it's got Star Trek dot com slash record. You can send us an email at feedback at it's got Star Trek. What, 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 well, at, at feedback at it's got Star Trek dot com, I should say. If you leave off the dot com, it won't get to us. It's, we're not we're not uh, Santa Claus. You can't just write. North Thanks, Pole. Agamus. <laughs> um youtube facebook uh, you know all that jazz we're on all that so uh and all that jazz yeah all that jazz and if you're interested more of our just our coverage of discovery you can go to the website go to it's got star trek.com you can click on Mm. uh on the menu there's all the all the series all the you know they're they're all there you click on one and it'll sort the podcast but don't get the tuna it smells funny tonight when you click on that menu item because it's tunas on the menu. Mm. Okay, I don't and that's it. actually that's a, a quote. Is that, is that a reference to something? That's actually a that's quote. A weird L lyric. Is yes, it, yes. It, Jesse knows. That's surprising. I'm don't surprised. Don't eat the tuna. Tuna. It Pro- smells funny tonight. It's, okay, okay. I know. I know that song. Oh. I mean, I'm a, I'm a weird owl guy. It's so a, it's on the right. Or the Kaiser. Yeah, right. Or the Kaiser. Instead of Eye of the Tiger. Early. Nice. Early. Nice. Early. Yang giving. All right. Uh, so that will conclude our discussion for the evening we look forward to talking to you talking at you about alf next week uh in the meantime uh, have a good one and we'll see you later bye-bye good one. he came back from the dead and his name rhymes with poo no. i'll go <laughs> right Stephen. um may we try a couple of the traditional readings again where you emphasize the word mind and the word gap yeah all right uh, are we rolling hi Stephen. this is clem fandango can you hear me yes i can hear you clem fandango so like the traditional delivery Stephen, where you hit the word mind and the word gap yeah thanks for clearing that up clem all part of the service Stephen. 